Hello and welcome to Connected with Lathan, where we discuss ideas, legal developments and business trends shaping the global economy. I'm Simon Hawkins, a counsel in Lathan's Hong Kong office, where I work in the Financial Institutions Group and the FinTech Group. I'm also co-chair of our Global Blockchain and Cryptocurrency Task Force. In this episode, we'll be discussing four legal and regulatory themes that we've observed in the payments industry during 2020, being alternative payments products, stable coins and central bank digital currencies, the stress testing of payments regulatory frameworks, regulatory change and its effect on market access and competitiveness, and the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on payments. Joining me for this discussion are Todd Beauchamp, a partner in our Washington DC office and co-chair of our FinTech industry group, and Christian McDermott, a partner in our London office. Todd, Christian, thanks for joining me. Sure, thanks Simon. Thanks Simon. So today I'd like to get your thoughts on our top four themes in payments that we've identified from a legal and regulatory perspective uh, based on what we've observed in the market over the last year or so. Um, and focusing on what regulators, central banks, supranational organizations, and our clients in the payment sector have been focusing on. Um, so the first theme that we've identified is the sort of rise of alternative payment products and networks, um, and, and specifically stable coins, so cryptocurrencies that have mechanisms to uh, stabilize the source of value. Um, which are often uh, often have been cited as innovators or disruptors in the the payment sector. Um, so, so Todd and Christian, um, what are some of the drivers that we've seen behind stable coins over the last years? Certainly, um, efficiency um, and cost and volatility issues are are kind of key drivers. Certainly with respect to traditional payment rails, there are inefficiencies and, and, uh, and higher costs associated with, uh, with money movement. And, and part of that's driven by the number of parties involved and the amount of effort required to, uh, to move funds through uh, those mechanisms. And when you have you know, crypto in, in various forms, as we do today, it's a one-to-one -one kind of global uh, transfer that can happen, um, you know, extremely quickly and, um, you know, for next to nothing in terms of transaction costs. And so um, that's a huge, huge driver with respect to stablecoin. I think one of the, uh, one of the issues with, with crypto generally as a, as a payment method has been volatility. Um, why am I going to trade out of my, my fiat currency where you know I know how much um, it, it's going to buy me today, odds are it's going to buy me about the same tomorrow uh, for something where that's far less certain. Enter stablecoin, where now I, I get that certainty, and I, I don't have the the big spikes and drops um, where you know I might have with something like Bitcoin. You know, if I'm able to solve that problem, then it becomes a much more viable payment method. And, um, and so I think that's, you know, that's a big driver. Um, yeah, I think another cross-border payments, as, as Todd was mentioning, is, is a great use case. And, and another one I think um, that's been touted is, is in relation to people who are unbanked or kind of struggling to access traditional payment methods. So they may not necessarily have a bank account to receive payments into, or they may not have access to, you know, uh, credit cards, debit cards, that kind of thing. Um, and I think generally speaking, um, internet access is, is a bit more broadly available than access to, to bank accounts and things like that. And so the hope is that some of these products um, might enable people who can't currently access um, uh, or not kind of financially excluded to be able to, to participate a bit more in the economy. Uh, I think it's, it does um, pose some challenges as well, though. I think one of the, one of the kind of key frictions around about getting a bank account, getting credit cards, things like that is, is AML and KYC. And I know there's um, question marks around it, but that in relation to stable coins as well, but there will be, I'm sure, um, kind of technology solutions around about the stable coin side of things that can try and streamline all of this in the same way that hopefully stable coins um, might have a role in streamlining cross-border payments as, as Todd was explaining. And stable coins definitely are going to be a key area of focus as well in the coming years, because the 
uh, Financial Stability Board, of course, has very recently put out its recommendations for um, regulators to to get to grips with stable coins and implement regulatory frameworks that are suitable for controlling the financial stability associated with them, which we'll see over the coming three years or so. But one of the other areas of, sort of digital currency that um, has had a real boost over the last year is um, central bank digital currencies, prompted somewhat by the, the potential growth for stable coins. So what are we seeing, Todd, uh, in the in the CBDC or the central bank digital currency world, of course, so in, in my part of the world, um, the the Chinese central bank digital currency, the the digital currency electronic payment token, um, has been started to be tested in some parts of China, um, and that's um, certainly drawn a lot of headlines and commentary. But but where do you see central bank digital currency development at the moment, Todd? It's all over the board, really. I mean, you have, and this number fluctuates, but 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 just a, a very large number of of central banks in, in at various levels of, of exploration and development with respect to their own their own digital currencies. And so it's it's, it's a very hot area, and I think it, it's reflective of the fact that that central banks don't want to be left out. Uh, they want to be relevant and don't want to see you know something come in and and you know sideline them. What happens and how you know their efforts might be merged with others and whether they can partner or otherwise rely on on other efforts whether those of other countries or or private efforts remains to be seen i think there's certainly some efficiencies associated with that perhaps particularly with respect to to smaller countries obviously a number of challenges but definitely interesting so the second theme we will look at is the way in which over the past year the regulatory frameworks for payments companies has been somewhat stress tested and notably in relation to the failure of uh, Wirecard, which was a, a European headquartered payment solutions company. Christian, uh, w- what are the sort of issues that have come out of the Wirecard fallout? Yeah, thanks, Simon. So as most of our listeners are probably aware, Wirecard was formerly one of Europe's biggest fintech success stories, but parts of the group are now in high profile insolvency proceedings. In the UK, Wirecard was best known for providing card sponsorship services, also sometimes referred to as bin sponsorship services. And that effectively involved Wirecard UK allowing businesses that didn't have their own regulatory authorizations to issue prepaid debit cards off the back of Wirecard's regulatory authorizations. Now, that's a fairly well-established, non-controversial and successful model. But what uh, the whole affair has really brought home are the potential risks faced by businesses who rely on this model. What's normally supposed to happen when a cardholder loads money onto a prepaid card is that the card issuer, so in this case, that's Wirecard UK, is supposed to safeguard those funds so that they are protected against the potential insolvency of the issuer. However, back in June, the UK Financial Conduct Authority placed a freeze on Wirecard UK's activities because of concerns about if and how funds were being safeguarded. And at this stage, I should say that all of this is in the public domain and you can find further details about the freeze on the FCA's website. What this meant for businesses who used Wirecard UK's sponsorship services was that their end users couldn't access their funds. And that's obviously extremely problematic, remembering that this was in the context of prepaid debit cards rather than any kind of investment product. So quick and easy access to funds was very important and was obviously halted because of the freeze. Now, the freeze was eventually lifted after about four days, uh, but because of Wirecard UK's broad customer base, it really served to highlight a shared single point of failure for a large number of fintech companies operating in the UK. So uh, that's um, it's also served to highlight some um, deficiencies in, in the overall safeguarding regime that currently applies across Europe. Um, so, for example, there are genuine concerns about even if the safeguarding rules are followed, are the are the funds that are in the safeguarded accounts really safeguarded from from insolvency proceedings um, and also in in a case like this where people are 
you know, ultimately customers or companies are are using the 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 funds as as day to day payment instruments. Um, does it really work that it's going to take them you know, a number of weeks or months to get access back to their funds where regulators are putting freezes on funds? So um, I think the expectation is that there's going to be some um, fairly significant regulatory changes in this area um, in Europe coming down the line. So definitely an area to watch this space in the EU and certainly in Singapore, the, the Monetary Authority of Singapore also had had to take similar action uh, in relation to Wirecard Singapore entity, which was its um, sort of hub for the Southeast Asia region as well. But Todd, in, in the US, Wirecard was had less of a presence, but has there been any other sort of similar US regulatory enforcement actions or um, or issues that raise the same theme of stress testing payments regulations? Well, I think certainly there's there's always always issues, right? The, the regulators constantly need to be on their toes as the space is pretty dynamic. But one thing that we have seen recently is a company by the name of uh, Beam Financial was offering an app-based solution where customers could obtain a, a savings account that offered above market rates. Beam was not a bank or other licensed service provider, but worked with a number of banks and other, other licensed providers to offer this product. Product. And uh, according to reports, customers would have an account with, with Beam, but then on the back end, the money movement would be um, handled by these providers. The issue apparently arose when uh, customers couldn't get access to these funds. And what has happened lately is, is the, uh, the Federal Trade Commission has uh, come after Beam, filing a complaint against them in federal court. And apparently uh, there are other, other lawsuits um, that are threatened. And so we'll see how that unfolds, but it, but it raises an interesting question uh, and one that we've, we've raised in the past, looking at, at various companies for, for different clients and deals and such uh, is if you have an unlicensed provider that is that's out there marketing an account or otherwise facilitating an account or, or, or a service, even though they're not the one that's engaged in providing the regulated service, if they are the sole, um, you know, sort of relationship that the customer has, um, you know, is that sufficient, or really should the, the the regulated provider of the services, you know, have the relationship? And uh, and it seems like you know that could you know potentially um, help avoid some of these issues. But we'll we'll see how that plays out. Yeah, and and within the sort of fintech uh, industry group more generally is uh, often an area of tension that we we see not just in payments but but elsewhere as well the uh, licensed versus unlicensed lines and when they get crossed and what the implications are if you're an unlicensed provider of fintech related services but then that brings us to our third theme which is just looking at the scope of regulatory change and whether or not some of the regulatory reforms that are underway are sort of improving or hindering market access and competitiveness Todd, the, the OCC fintech charter has been around for a while. Um, there's this new potential payments charter. Can you just give us a quick overview of how things are progressing on, on those fronts in the US? Sure. Uh, yeah, well, the, the fintech charter was the first to be announced a couple of years ago. And as a result of some litigation from the New York State Department of Financial Services and the Conference of State Banking Supervisors challenging the OCC's authority, the, uh, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, which is our U.S. federal bank uh, regulator, the authority of the OCC to issue that charter, that concept is effectively dead. And in its place, the OCC has introduced this, this concept of a payments charter charter more narrow in scope than the, than the fintech charter really focused just on payments. I guess the principal difference is the fintech charter would have provided the ability to engage in lending activity. Payments charter is really just focused on facilitating payments and would provide through a 2.0 version of that charter potential to uh, have direct access to the Federal Reserve payment system. But that's something that, that's relatively new. Uh, details are still emerging, though the comptroller, Brian Brooks, who was formerly, uh, uh, most recently, before, uh, before joining the, the OCC, general counsel at, uh, at 
Coinbase is certainly, uh, you know, familiar with the fintech industry and very much uh, progressive with respect to the fintech industry had announced that they're effectively open for business in accepting applications. And also that a national trust charter seems to be an option for crypto banks and that, that more of those are expected. So certainly a lot of potential movement there, though, with the you know results of the election shift in administration, we'll see how that impacts all of this movement and whether, you know, a Biden administration will continue these concepts or, um, or, or shift or, you know, reverse course, who knows. And uh, Christian, in, in the EU, um, similarly, some regulatory reform, um, notably Payment Services Directive 3 and the um, strong customer authentication enhancements. Can you speak to those? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, currently the, the regime in force in Europe is, is PSD2, which is second payment services directive. Um, and discussions are underway around about PSD3. I think one of the, the key focuses of, of that initiative, will, will, I think, will be on harmonization. Um, generally, European legislation is, of course, supposed to be harmonized, but I think it's it's, it's fairly clear that there have been some um, fairly significant differences in implementation in different jurisdictions. Um, that has allowed for maybe a bit of regulatory arbitrage and, and otherwise just a bit of uncertainty on how particular rules are, are interpreted. So I think there'll be a key focus there. Um, and you mentioned, yeah, you mentioned uh, strong customer authentication as well. That's, that's an initiative that's currently underway um, and the requirements. Overall, we, we published a piece on our, on our Payments of Fintech blog, um, the Latham Payments of Fintech blog, a while back uh, on how timelines for the implementation of strong customer authentication, which is essentially um, a requirement to add extra layers of security onto payment transactions. So, for example, if, if you or I were buying something um, online, it's no longer enough to input your card details. You would also have to have another kind of factor to authenticate that it's you that's making the transaction. Um, that SE initiative is timelines are already under pressure um, and COVID-19 has, has obviously had an impact on those on those technology builds. Um, overall, it sounds like the, you know, the increase in, in e-commerce that, that COVID-19 has, has partially driven increases the, the risk of fraud. But um, there's, I think there's a really a, a balancing act to be had here overall because implementation of these big technology builds um, inevitably comes at a cost. And there's going to be, you know, or there's forecast to be increases in, in um, basket abandonment when, you know, people click through all the way to, to almost finalize their transaction and then realize they've got to, you know, put in another bit of information they don't necessarily have to hand and, and ultimately can't be bothered to throw their hands up in the air and, and don't buy at the end of, uh, at the, end of the, the, the whole process. So it's it's controversial and and still remains to be seen how it's going to be how it's going to be implemented. Um, I think another another big trend, one that's not really new, um, but could lead to other trends, is is open banking. That's something that was kind of um, pioneered in the UK, also an aspect of PSD two that's that's kind of coming into its own now. Um, that's uh, you know whereby effectively there's a regulatory requirement that uh, holders or providers of payment accounts. Um, share information to appropriately kind of authorize and permission third parties to, for example, present um, all of an individual's bank account details in one place and, and also potentially allow them to initiate transactions off the back of that information. Um, that's been something that's going around for a while. Again, a big um, investment and in, in overhaul in, in Europe. Uh, I think some um, commentators are talking about potentially this uh, moving into wider, not just open banking, but open finance, um, whereby not you wouldn't just see your bank account details, but other investments that you hold, even going into things like you know paying utility bills, council tax, um, all those kind of things, which which could come down the line and and, and could be further trends. Again, I think the the key thing from my perspective as a commercial lawyer is is. Um, there being a, a balance between the cost of of the the market players being required to do these things and the and the upsides, whether it's customer protection or kind of just general um, economic uptick. Uh, but those are the probably the key things um, to watch out for in, in Europe in the next couple of years. 
Definitely. I think it'd be really interesting to see how the customer authentication requirements play out commercially, um, especially kind of in, in conjunction with the openness of open banking versus these uh, new quite stringent um, authentication requirements on the payment side is, is going to be an interesting thing to watch next year. But since you mentioned COVID, this wouldn't be a podcast in 2020 without us talking about the impact of COVID. And that indeed is our fourth and final theme. So, so obviously the, the merchants all over the world have been grappling with this accelerated shift to e-commerce and the need to have greater digitization of payments at the point of sale, which has included contactless payments, fraud and chargeback mit- mitigation solutions, uh, financing even at the point of sale. So what are the kind of themes that we're seeing from the impact of COVID? Perhaps, uh, Christian, you can, you can start us off. Yeah, sure. I think um, one of the things that, again, was was already a trend for a while was the move away from cash towards um, digital means of payment. And it seems from all the all the stats that I've seen, at least, that that's something that's been accelerated by COVID-19. Um, so, yeah, a big decline in cash, which was, you know, already declining, not necessarily all on the way out, but um, definitely declining. So um, there's there's certainly been the there's been that move. I think um, something that is is being talked about a lot in in the UK and Europe is is the buy now pay later models that you mentioned. Uh, the key thing that I would highlight on those is that you know these are the these are the kind of the the products that allow people to either you know spread their the payment for something over a, over a certain period of time or necess- or just postpone paying you know the whole um, balloon payment until until some point further down the line. Um, the thing that, in my experience, from you looking into these arrangements from a legal perspective, is that they come in lots of different shapes and sizes, and there's lots of different means by which this postponement of payment is uh, is achieved and facilitated. Um, so, in some cases, it's it's as simple as uh, kind of a regulated consumer credit product, which is you know fairly vanilla. Uh, there's others that are a bit more um, innovative and, and sophisticated that that utilize uh, kind of existing. Um, credit lines from credit cards uh, to kind of repurpose them and, and uh, rebrand them to, to increase sales. Uh, the other thing I think linked into that is also the, the receivables financing aspect of it. So there is a merchant um, behind all of this who's hoping to get paid for goods and services that they've provided. And um, you know they'll be wanting to get paid as soon as they can. And there, there need to be kind of financing mechanisms in the background that allow that payment to happen while there's the consumer payment is still being postponed. Uh, and obviously, there's lots of diligence that goes into that as well. Um, so those are areas that we've all worked on recently um, and are, you know, from my perspective, very interesting and, and set to continue. And Todd, in, in the US, um, uh, cash transactions have decreased as well and electronic uh, transactions have been on the increase. Um, any concerns from a financial inclusion perspective uh, in the US? Yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting. I mean, Americans tend to like cash, certainly embracing electronic payments, but I think as a society tend to like cash. And pre-COVID, there had been a, um, a pretty strong push in certain states to require merchants to continue to accept cash. In other words, to prohibit kind of the 100% electronification uh, of, of payments at retail. And obviously now we're in a world where people don't really want to touch cash and in fact, there's shortages of cash and coin because people just aren't using it. And so you have circulation problems. It'll be interesting to see what what happens to those as we move forward. And also prior to the pandemic, the primary impetus for a merchant to invest in, in upgrading its systems for things like contactless payments, apart from you know ease of use, would be fraud. But now um, you know there's actually uh, you know customer preference becomes part of a uh, part of the, the calculus. I think, and you can see where now, in addition to back-end concerns, a merchant may see that, uh, you know, customers actually, uh, you know, really want to have those options, whereas before maybe they didn't care so much. And so maybe there's greater justification for that investment, though obviously balanced with the fact that retail is is uh, not as uh, not nearly as robust as it, as it was, uh, you know, given current economic uh, circumstances. So, you know, challenging. Thank you both for your insights. That brings us to the end of our uh, podcast and having articulated our 
our four uh, key themes that we've observed from a legal and regulatory perspective in uh, in the payments world over the last year. Um, thank you, Todd and Christian, for, for joining me. My pleasure, Simon. Thanks, Simon. And thank you all for listening to this episode uh, in our Connected with Latham podcast series. More on this topic can be found on our fintech blog at lw.com. You can subscribe and listen to new and archived episodes of Latham's podcasts on lw.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen to podcasts. If you'd like more information about the topics in this podcast, please email us using the links located in the show description. And we hope you'll join us again next time. This podcast is provided as a service of Latham & Watkins, LLP. Listening to this podcast does not create an attorney-client relationship between you and Latham & Watkins, LLP. And you should not send confidential information to Latham & Watkins, LLP. While we make every effort to assure that the content of this podcast is accurate, comprehensive, and current, we do not warrant or guarantee any of those things. And you may not rely on this podcast as a substitute for legal research and or consulting a qualified attorney. Listening to this podcast is not a substitute for engaging a lawyer to advise you on your individual needs. Should you require legal advice on the issues covered in this podcast, please consult a qualified attorney. Under New York's Code of Professional Responsibility, portions of this communication contain attorney advertising. Prior results do not guarantee a similar outcome. Results depend upon a variety of factors unique to each representation. Please direct all inquiries regarding the conduct of Latham & Watkins attorneys under the New York's disciplinary rules to Latham & Watkins, LLP, 885 3rd Avenue, New York, New York, 10022-4834. Phone number 1212-906-1200.